Okay, thank you much. This will be my first TED. Uh, make sure I'm not breathing there. This will be my first TED, so let's see if I can do a good job for you guys. Okay, so good evening. Um, let me, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Paul Verhaeg, and I'm an amateur near space explorer, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, that means I launch experiments into the mid-stratosphere, and I'll talk about how I get up there, and, and or not me, but how my experiments get up there, and the kind of experiments that I perform, and some of the stuff that I see from up there. Um, exploring near space is my art of being human, and now I'd like to share with you uh, what it takes to be an explorer of this penultimate uh, frontier. Uh, growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut, and I'm sure a lot of people and a lot of the young people here want to be an astronaut also, and that's not an unusual desire for young boys and young girls also, by the way. A 2009 survey of 3,000 students found that 9%, one of them, wanted to be astronauts. That was the fourth most popular career choice after being simply famous like being a movie star or a sports athlete. Um, attendance at space camps and also at Air and Space Museums also reflect that interest that people have in, in being an astronaut. Uh, Virgin Galactic and SpaceX, these are companies, they're going to capitalize on this desire. Uh, they're going to be prepared to send people and their experiments into space. Uh, however, the cost still works against us. Right now, the cost of sending a, a one pound experiment or one pound payload into space is around $4,000. I don't have that kind of money. I can't do that. Um, however, um, I can get part way there. I can get up high enough that it looks and feels a lot like space. And that's what I'll talk about here. And that's why near space is a viable option for people like me. So let's step back for a moment and ask, where is near space? There are two organizations that are involved with, the, with that definition of near space. Uh, the first is the, is the Federal Aviation Administration, who works in conjunction with the International Civil uh, Aviation Organization. And they define the use of airspace. And they uh, have topped out airspace at flight level 600 or 60,000 feet. That's the top of controlled airspace. Above that is uncontrolled airspace. Now, the second organization is the International Aeronautical Federation, or the FAI. And they, have, they are the organization that sets the standards and maintains records for, rec uh, for, records for uh, events in, in, air, uh, in aviation. And they have set a record or a level at uh, 328,000 feet, which is the Kármán line, as the boundary for space. Now, as you know, an airplane flies because the air, uh, air passes over the wing. And as that massive air passes over the wing, it creates lift. The lower the air density, so the higher the altitude, the faster the airplane has to move to generate the lift. At an altitude of about 328,000 feet, you have to move as fast to generate the lift that you need as you would have to stay in orbit. So 328,000 feet becomes that altitude for space. Um, so what we have is uh, near space being above controlled airspace, so above 60,000 feet, but below 328,000 feet. And that is going to be the altitude of near space, so 100 kilometers or 62 miles. Uh, many of you have flown in airplanes, and you have a passing familiarity of what it's like to be at 30,000 feet. Uh, you know that the horizon gets more distant. If you were to step out there at the outside of the airplane, it gets decidedly colder uh, and uh, it gets more difficult to breathe as air pressure drops, but also you begin to see that the sky begins to get a little bit darker. In near space, it's much more extreme. In near space, the atmospheric pressure drops down to about 1% of the atmospheric pressure in this room, so 99% vacuum. Um, when you get up to around 50,000 feet, it drops down to about minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on your latitude that you launch from. Uh, the uh, background count from cosmic rays goes up because cosmic rays originate in space. Uh, the distance to the horizon increases. Uh, in fact, it can be over 300 miles once you get up high enough. Also, our sky is blue because of what's called Rayleigh scattering. Blue light is, from the sun is preferentially scattered, whereas red light is not. Once we get up high enough into near space, there's not enough air to scatter the light, and the sky turns velvety blackness that we associate with space. Now, near space is a, is a unique location. I can't visit it myself because it's far too lethal. Uh, we sent up insects, and they don't come back alive. So if you want to get rid of cockroaches in your house, send them up to 80,000 feet. I guarantee that will kill them off. However, I can design experiments that take, uh, that, that take me kind of... Uh, my avatar, in a way, up to near space, gets me that satisfaction I get for uh, wanting to be an astronaut. So how do we get up to near space? Um, 
you know, airplanes only get up to about 30,000 feet. There are some that get up higher. Um, I can't afford the airplanes that get up to 100,000 feet, for instance. Rockets get up that high. But model rockets that get up to that high, the motors are very expensive to do that. Plus, I just can't launch those in my backyard. The way I have to do it is through weather balloons. So I fill up a, a latex balloon that weighs about two and a half pounds. I put about 270 cubic feet of helium into it, and now I'm putting hydrogen into it. And that gets my experiments up to altitude. We're talking about 12 pounds of experiments. Uh, between the uh, weather balloon, you'll see that there's a string that goes from the weather balloon down to the parachute. That's my load line. To give you a sense of scale, that's about 15 feet. So this the whole device that we're sending up here, the near spacecraft, is about 50, 40 to 50 feet tall. It's a big beast. Uh, and then we have the parachute. I carry up the parachute by the apex with the load line. That way, when the balloon bursts, the parachute opens up instantly, brings everything down safely. And then we have below that are my tracking modules and the experiments that we're going to send up. Uh, the tracking modules, I use amateur radio, and uh, we combine those GPS receivers into a system called the Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APERS. Uh, despite what you hear on the internet, using your cell phone, GPS-enabled cell phone, to track a near spacecraft is not a good idea. Cell phone towers like to receive signals on the horizon. They don't like to receive signals from things overhead. Plus, there's a lot of places, even in Missouri, where there's very poor uh, cell phone coverage. And you're, if you're land there, you're not going to get your packages back. So there's where you have it. You have something that looks and feels a lot like space. It's very affordable. A balloon, $60, something like that. Uh, the hydrogen gas, uh, less than $100, so $150 or so, and I can send an experiment into something that looks and feels a lot like space, and it's very quick. I can literally launch an experiment in the morning and have it back down on the ground in time for lunch. So we do launch, and then we do lunch afterwards. Uh, let's talk about some of the experiments. Um, I like sending weather stations up, so temperature, pressure, and relative humidity. And in a moment, I'll show you some graphs of what that data looks like from those altitudes. Um, but I can see where the, the cloud layers are at. I can see how cold it gets up in there. I can watch the pressure change and see how dry it is in near space. Geiger counters. I like to send up Geiger counters so I can measure cosmic rays. Cosmic ray experiments were a, a big uh, physics experiment back in the 1920s and 1930s, and I can replicate some of those experiments. Photometers that measure the intensity of light. Well, I could point that photometer at the sun, measure ultraviolet B and the spectrum of ultraviolet B, and I can tell you how much ozone there is above the near spacecraft. Also, I can do experiments in geomorphology. I can take cameras, point them down, and look at the ground. I can tell you resource utilization, like how big the roads are, how much land they take up, how big are the cities, power lines. We can also show you the lay of the land. Looking at the way trees lie, we can tell you what direction the land is flowing based on water draining over the land. So this has been an example of, this is actual data collected by me that, tell, that I get the temperature. Um, people know you expect that the temperature gets colder as you go up in altitude. You climb the mountains, uh, you see that it gets colder. But interesting thing here is that around 42,000 feet, it actually starts getting warmer again. So I like to do this experiment, give this to students, and have them try to figure out the puzzle, why is it getting warmer again? Well, we're getting warmer because we're in the stratosphere. The stratosphere has the ozone that protects us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun. That energy has to go somewhere, so it shows up as thermal, and it warms, and the, the air is actually warmer at, at higher altitudes. So on this day, the stratosphere started at 42,000 feet. Measure relative humidity. And on this case here, you see there are two cloud layers. One at about 5,000 feet, where we have a spike in the relative humidity, where we go up to about 90%. We're passing through a low-level cloud deck. Another one occurs at around just under 30,000 feet, about 25,000 feet. We have another spike. That would be cirrus clouds at around 25,000 feet. Above that, the air is very dry, about 10% relative humidity. And then once we get up around 95,000 feet, the relative humidity sensor gets a little glitchy, so we start getting these spiky data points. Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays originate from space, in some cases, probably from supernova explosions. They're atoms from another star in most cases. Uh, people expect and they understand that cosmic rays go up in altitude, or increase in, is in intensity as you go up in altitude, and we see that. But what's really interesting is if you look at this graph at around 62,000 feet, the count actually starts going down. So I saw this for the first time, and I was puzzled over what was going on. I'll never forget this data, and I learned something about cosmic rays. 
cosmic rays, when they enter into their atmosphere, will collide with molecules of oxygen and nitrogen. They'll shatter those molecules and blast them into bits. So I'll have one primary cosmic ray get converted into tens to hundreds of secondary cosmic rays. That's what we see occurring around 62,000 feet. Below that, the atmosphere then shelters or shields those cosmic rays from reaching the ground. So as we go up in altitude, we're measuring more and more of the secondary cosmic rays before the atmosphere absorbs them. Once we get to around 62,000 feet, we start measuring primary cosmic rays. And with the Geiger counter that I'm using on these balloon sats, I can actually count each individual detection. So I'm actually counting individual atoms from another star once I get above 62,000 feet or so. This is a picture looking down. This was at about 50,000 feet. Uh, below this is a, is a capsule we sent up that's doing its own experiments. Uh, pictures like this, we can see trees as being the slightly darker, uh, darker regions. They have branches where those branches point down. That's the slope of the land pointing down because water wants to flow down. And the trees like to accumulate or grow the most where the water is flowing into creeks and rivers. It's also really cool to realize you're seeing an entire town in one picture. Uh, this picture here, we're looking almost 10 miles across in one picture. It would take me almost 10 minutes to drive across that picture. Uh, we can make maps from this data. Uh, students can actually map out roads and cities. This is the pictures that, these are the ones that are important to me. I started near space because of pictures like this. You take a picture like this into the photo lab and you have a good chance of someone asking if you're an astronaut. It's happened twice. <sighs> yeah, how'd you know? So pictures like this, this was taken at about 90,000 feet. You can see we're up high enough where we begin to see the curvature of the Earth, and the sky is black. The atmosphere, most of the atmosphere, over 90% of it is below the balloon. The distance to the horizon is over 300 miles in this case. So we're seeing the entire state of Kansas in this picture. In fact, we're seeing into Missouri. We're spying on Missouri in this picture. Um, how to begin a program. This is how I began a program, and you can do the same thing to start your own program. The first thing is I had an amateur radio license. I was an amateur radio operator. That was, uh, so I already had my first step. It's not difficult to get an amateur radio license. If you do that, you can get involved with these kind of programs uh, if you would like. Uh, second, I had to start building the airframes. So I used styrofoam, three quarter inch thick styrofoam. It's really easy to manufacture. It's really lightweight. Plus it's good insulation because it's brutally cold up there in near space. Then the aviation electronics or avionics start using programmable microcontrollers. They can get data from the GPS. They can also collect data from my sensors, and they can store that data on board, and they can track the progress of the flight, and then when the balloon sets or my spacecraft lands, I can get the data back out. A parachute. Uh, you can buy parachutes commercially that are large enough for capsules like this. I sewed my first parachutes from ripstop nylon from a retired hot air balloon. And it was a good thing that I did that because I was sewing this parachute from scratch without really understanding what I was doing. So having a mass of uh, very cheap fabric to experiment was a really good deal for me. Then start designing the experiments. If you do any kind of thing, any kind of programming with robotics, you have a good step on designing experiments. Um, digital cameras and video cameras are really lightweight and they're really good cameras, uh, really good experiments to put on your capsules. Uh, support equipment. You've got to fill a balloon with about 270 cubic feet of helium. Now, not a lot of people do that, so that you just can't go to the Walmart and pick up a balloon filler for that. So go to a welding supply store, you pick up the parts and you, and you couple them together, and you can actually dump a bunch of helium or hydrogen into a balloon very quickly. Uh, prediction software. There's actually online software now through uh, nearspaceventures.com. You can put in how fast your balloon will rise. So in my case, about 1,000 feet per minute. A maximum altitude, predicted around 85,000 feet tell it where I would like to launch from. It then takes the winds aloft uh, predictions for that location on that day and will actually predict what, how my balloon will go up, burst, and then parachute back down again. And if I'm going to parachute into an area that's safe, I'm go for launch. And then finally, there's FAR 101, Federal Aviation Regulation Chapter 101, that governs the use of balloons, rockets, and kites. You need to be familiar with this. I became familiar with this regulation before I could launch, started launching. It's a fairly straightforward regulation. Uh, it's not that difficult to meet the requirements of it. It was just a matter of me reading the materials because it is written by the government. It takes you a little time to kind of sort through what they're trying to say. The example, ready to do a launch here. So you can see the balloon in the background. This balloon has just got it started filling. The balloon will be about seven feet tall when we're finally filled. So you know that we just started filling this balloon. On the bed sheet in front of us are our tracking capsules and the experiments that are balloon sats or balloon satellites. 
put them on the bed sheet so we just keep the dirt off of them. Now we've done a launch. Uh, this this um, near spacecraft from the top of the balloon down to the bottom capsule is 30 to 40 feet tall. It's fairly large. This is going to rise at about 1,000 to 1,200 feet per minute. It will get to an altitude of approximately 85,000 feet. We can get higher uh, with larger balloons if you want to spend more money in this. Um, when we land, if we land where there are trees, uh, there seems to be magnets built into the trees and the parachutes. We, tend, we will land on top of the trees. The problem is that the near spacecraft is very lightweight, so it likes to lay on top of the canopy of the trees. It may only take us an hour to get to the landing site. You know, we may only land four miles away. We may only land, we may go land 100 miles away. We can typically, because a flight takes about 90 minutes to go up and an hour, 45 minutes to an hour to go down, we can usually be in the recovery zone when it comes down. If we get up in a tree like this, we're going to be in the recovery zone probably another two or three hours trying to get the stuff out of the trees. Uh, but usually we land someplace that's a little more easy to extract our payloads. We go talk to the landowner before we go walk into their cornfields. Their parachute's laying out there. There's an audio beacon that's so screaming out loud. You can hear where it's at. And we have a successful recovery. Bring it back. We go do lunch. Uh, some resources. Uh, if you'd like to get involved with something like this, uh, go to magazines like Nuts and Volts and CQVHF. They have monthly columns on amateur near space. The Citizen Scientist, which is the online newsletter of the Society of Amateur Scientists, has past issues of articles that I've written on doing balloon sets, so how to do the math and the engineering and the programming that you need to do a balloon sat launch. Uh, my website, I did my 112th flight today. We got to 116,000 feet. I post the results of those balloon flights on my website, uh, put links to some of the other information that I've written. Um, read this stuff so you'll read about my mistakes so you don't make them. Let me make the mistakes for you. Uh, I wrote a book on near space. It's on the Parallax website, who, who creates the basic stamp too. Uh, that book is a little dated, but the, some of the directions are still relevant, like on how to fill weather balloons. Nearspaceventures.com. This has the online tracking software. Visit these folks, run these predictions, see how the flight's going to go, make sure you can safely do a launch. And then finally, the Great Plains Super Launch is an annual meeting of amateurs who fly balloons like I do. We meet again in the mid-June of 2013 in Pella, Iowa. Come out and see the Dutch and learn how to do balloon launches with us. And if you're there, please look me up. Other than that, that's near space in a nutshell. I'd like to see people get involved with it. It's a great science and engineering um, expedition.